You're sending us a lot of questions about the vaccine, and by far, of all the viewer questions I'm getting, the most common one is, go something like, I'm allergic to blank XYZ, can I get this vaccine? Well, I can't answer that personally, but we've brought in for you someone who can. I'd like to introduce you to clinical immunologist and allergist, Dr. Zainab Abdurrahman, who is also an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at McMaster University. That's in Hamilton. She's in Toronto for us this morning. Doctor, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Are you getting anything in your practice similar to what we're getting here in our, t in our team? All these questions about, can I get this vaccine because of my allergies? Absolutely. We're getting a lot of that. I think every allergist across the country is getting that question right now. Well, so you've been thinking about this and you're just the person to have on the program. Health Canada on the weekend put out this new guidance uh, saying that anyone who is allergic to any of the ingredients in this Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine should not get the shot. So you are supposed to consult the component parts of the vaccine. But even if you look at those, that doesn't mean you necessarily as a layperson understand. So help us understand this. Can we start with the medicinal ingredient first, the mRNA, this new messenger RNA? What do we know about allergies there? So typically you actually don't have allergies to mRNA. Um, although it's new to have it in a vaccine form, um, we actually are exposed to mRNA. Some of the viruses, actually, whenever they do infect you, they actually have mRNA that's produced, and then that's how they produce their own proteins within your body. So you're actually exposed to mRNA from viruses, um, generally when you catch infections um, or other pathogens. So that's not unusual for you to be exposed to. Okay. It's just a different way of us delivering it in a vaccine. This so time. that's interesting because they haven't used it before in this way, I wondered if we would even know that we were allergic to it in a vaccine form. And people often wonder if the mRNA can affect their DNA. So the way it works in terms of DNA and RNA is it's actually more of a one-way um, procedure. So you have your DNA and then you produce mRNA from DNA and then the the mRNA makes proteins. So when it's in your body, it's going to be used to make a protein, and then your body is going to make antibodies to that protein. It doesn't go backwards, it doesn't incorporate into your DNA, and afterwards, actually, that mRNA degrades because mRNA is not very stable, and that's actually why there's so many requirements about how we keep it in terms of the vaccine to keep it stable because it actually will degrade. So it will not go back, it will not get incorporated into your DNA. It's not going to change you forever. Okay, that's a, that's a good thing to know as well, although not specifically allergy-related. So let's come back to, so the only medicinal ingredient is that mRNA, but there are other non-medicinal ingredients that we're going to pull up and take a look. If you could go through some of those, because again, ALC and all of those numbers, I mean, a lot of that I don't understand. Uh, uh, on this list, what is the most important thing that you think we should focus on there? So on this list, um, the only one uh, ingredient on this list that has actually been associated with allergic reactions in the past is the polyethylene glycol. And so you can see that in the middle of that ALC0159. And that has actually been shown to be um, a very rare allergy, um, but there are a small portion of patients who may be allergic to this. This allergy is very rare, but people who have it are very aware because it actually is um, something we're commonly exposed to. So those patients with an allergy to this are well known typically to their allergists already. So to what would be, in, how would you be commonly exposed to and what, where else would you find this? So polyethylene glycol is actually found in a lot of medication formulations. It's used to stabilize a lot of medications. In addition, it's the primary ingredient in many laxatives. So if you've ever had, um, you know, occasional constipation and used um, something like um, PEG3350 or Laxaday, or if you have taken common medications such as Tylenol. So common formulations of Tylenol, including the liquid form and the adult tablet form, both contain polyethylene glycol. And I believe that's one of the most commonly used medications across the country. Okay, so you will know if you are an allergic, and that is one thing to watch for. As we bring up that list again, there are sodium salts, I guess, and sucrose, and things mm -hmm. that you say are not of particular concern. Uh, but as we look at, but people who have, the questions that I'm getting, who have mm -hmm. food allergies, doctor, who have egg allergies, who have environmental allergies, is there anything on that list that, that jumps out at you that could be worrisome? 
No, none of these ingredients are um, plant proteins or um, food proteins. So as much as you see this list, what I think is important for all the patients who have allergies out there is what is not on this list. There is no common foods in this list, okay? There's no egg in here, there's no milk. We don't have any concerns because there's no food proteins in this formulation. There's no grass or um, environmental allergens in here. There's no instant insect stinging venoms in here. So, and there's no common medications in here. So there's no penicillin, there's no antibiotics. And so, that is actually more important is what's not on the list rather than the list because of the whole list the only thing that can that has been shown of concern is polyethylene glycol which is very rare for an allergy but the things that are not is what's important for the allergy sufferers so the common things that you're worried about in terms of your foods environmental allergens like pollens or dust mites venoms all of those and com common medications are not on this list. So that's good news uh, indeed to find that. Now a uh, reassuring too. So let me just ask one other thing because in addition to the specific recommendations for people who are allergic to ingredients they should not take this vaccine for now. There was also guidance saying that anyone who has experienced a severe allergic reaction to another vaccine drug or food to speak with their doctor before they go ahead. So what constitutes a severe allergic reaction and what kind of a time frame do we have to consider here. So typically, severe allergic reactions are actually very quick. They're mediated by um, an antibody that causes very quick reactions. So typically, when we're talking about it, we're talking about having a reaction within the first 30 to 60 minutes that involves multiple aspects of your body. So it could involve dropping blood pressure, breathing problems, swelling. So it affects multiple parts of your body very quickly after exposure. So that's a severe allergy. And the reason is they just want you to have an open conversation to make sure that you are not um, one of the people who has that rare allergy. Um, and just to make sure that people have an opportunity to discuss this um, with a trusted healthcare provider. Okay, but generally speaking, for example, I'm somebody who was very allergic, I just used my own experience, food allergies, smallpox vaccine, but when I was very, very young. I mean, if, if we're looking at adult population right now getting this vaccine, is that, do you have to think back to when you were a child in terms of whether you are a potential risk and should be discussing this with your doctor even now? So the key is really, um, it's about current allergies. So okay. we know that you can actually outgrow allergies. So there's many people who are previously allergic to some foods who are no longer or who reacted to um, another vaccine. The components of this vaccine are actually unlike any of the other vaccines. Um, a lot of times these are kind of put out out of the abundance of caution. But we know that the people who are at risk are really those who have an allergy or anaphylaxis to a prior dose of this vaccine or one of the issues with one of the ingredients listed here, namely that polyethylene glycol. Okay. So it's at the end of this conversation, I'm feeling reassured. Is that the right impression we should be reassured about this? You should be. Um, to be honest, uh, having um, allergies does not really put you at a higher risk of concern with this vaccine. People who were in the studies also had allergies. The only people who were excluded were those who had um, anaphylaxis or allergy to one of the components um, in the past. But otherwise, people with regular allergies, food, medications, et cetera, were in the studies, and we did not see an increased signal for reactions. So you should feel very comforted in terms of getting this vaccine. The only concerns are if you've had prior anaphylaxis to a prior dose, as this is a two-dose vaccine, or if you've had an allergy or anaphylaxis to one of the components for which the main one that has been associated with allergy is polyethylene glycol. I'm going to keep this conversation on tape and replay it for all of our viewers who have questions about this. Thanks so much for all of the time and for helping <laughs> us navigate what is asked about so frequently. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Zainab Abdurrahman, who is in Toronto for us this morning, but associated with Mac in Hamilton.